This week on Teachers Off Duty Podcast, we're jumping into the Shark Tank with Damon John to talk about financial literacy and his new book, Little Damon Learns to Earn. Welcome back, everybody, for a very special episode of Teachers Off-Duty Podcast. Today, we're going to be talking about teaching very important life skills to young children. And the person we have doing this, he's fantastic. He is a multi-billion dollar investor, CEO of FUBU. Mr. Damon John is in the house. All right. What's happening? Damon, we are so happy to have you here. I mean, you're, you are such a perfect person to talk about this whole concept, talking about financial literacy and teaching it to young kids. And before we dive into that, for anybody who's been living under a rock, tell us about yourself. Tell us a little bit about your history. History, uh, you know, came up in New York City, love this new kind of music called hip hop, I, but I couldn't rap, sing or dance. So, <laughs> you know, I decided to come up with a clothing line that was really, you know, like the uniform of hip hop called Kubu. And, uh, you know, that would, uh, that would give me some notoriety around the world. And, uh, I started investing in other clothing lines and then all of a sudden I get called for some, so we'll start back where my job is to, um, help teach. Uh, these other four idiots that I stood on the path with, uh, <laughs> and as well as invest in other people and get Barbara to take her medicine. And then, you know, that that's my job. That's so cool. And before uh, you came on, I was talking with some of the, I was talking with Tell and Laura, and I said, you know, when I was in high school, in our business class, every Friday, we would watch Shark Tank. <laughs> so <laughs> it's so crazy when watching you in that setting, and now all of a sudden we're interviewing you. Like, it, it's so, so cool. So I love that you're an entrepreneur, you know, you have this clothing line, but you also are now an author. Um, so uh, we've read uh, Little Damon Learns to Earn. Um, I'm a yes. pre-K teacher. So what I loved about that is as I was reading this, because I was telling them, like, I don't know, like we have dramatic play for money and stuff. But as I was reading your book, I'm like, oh, my gosh, my pre-K kids would love this. So uh -huh. um, you're one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world, but you're also a father. So yes. What does this book mean to you and why is it important for you as a dad to have written this? You know, I'm taking my third uh, trip down the aisle of being a dad. My first marriage, I have, uh, you know, two girls that are 29 and 24. Mm -hmm. And then I have my second marriage where I have my little girl who's six. And, um, you know, it's a different time from when my other girls were yeah. older. Um, and I realized that I just couldn't find any things that I could give my little girl today to show her how to be financially responsible. Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate because a lot of, as you know, the school system is very old and mm -hmm. you know, they're not teaching our children or they're not asking you to teach our children mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, credit cards yeah. and uh, finance. And then what happens is, you know, at 17 years old, they can take six to $700,000 worth of debt for a dog. They're not even sure they want. And they're not going to pay that off until they're 50 or 60. If you're lucky enough to pay it off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> if you're lucky enough to pay it off, for I sure. Know. I'm like, I'm 28 and I still got all my student loans. <laughs> they're just hanging yeah. out behind yeah. my shoulder. <laughs> you know, the odd thing is about that when you took those student loans, those people all have financial intelligence. Those big institutions have financial intelligence that way. Well, shop them to you. Yep. Yeah. Damn it. One of the things that I love about your book is you talk about financial literacy at a young age. When do you think is yeah. the appropriate time to start talking about that with kids? About five or six, because I think that, um, you know, money becomes a stressful conversation usually. And, and when a child just grows up hearing it as stress or not understanding the value of it, you know, when you say, you know how hard I work for that, they usually go, <laughs> not really. <Yeah. laughs> you know, um, and if you don't teach them the value that of oh, money that could buy you freedom, and I'm not talking about buying you things, money buys you freedom, whatever it is, right? To give to a charitable organization, have more time with your family. So, you know, I trained my daughter and I've been going through this with my daughter and this is my lifelong goal because whether a business works out or not that I have, that's fine, but I'm always going to want to teach my daughter the next thing about 
finance, about our health, about nutrition, about being a biracial child, about all these things. So this is my lifelong goal is to teach her more and more. All I'm doing is sharing with all the other parents of the world. This episode of Teachers Off-Duty Podcast is brought to you by Athletic Greens. All right, calling all teachers. I know with our hectic schedules, endless to-do lists, and immense stress our jobs put on us, we don't always have time to take a step back and reflect on our own health. I mean, let's be real. All teachers could use more energy, some super strength immune systems, and stress support. Thanks to Athletic Greens, you can start building a foundation for better health. One daily serving of AG1 delivers a powerful blend of nine health products, such as multivitamins, minerals, and probiotics. AG1 promotes gut health, supports immunity, boosts energy, and helps recovery. That's one scoop, once a day, every day. Whether you just want to drink it at home or take it with you on the go, you can get the perfect AG1 for any health routine. So if you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to athleticgreens.com slash T-O-D. That's athleticgreens.com slash T-O-D. Check it out. What do you say to the parents that listen to this and, and, and the ones that aren't teachers and say, you know what, I'm not a teacher. I don't know how to teach my kid about these things. What are the first steps that parents can do in teaching if they don't feel comfortable with teaching, if that makes sense? Be very honest. Uh, before I put things in formats like this, I'm not a good teacher. I have a, I have a massive respect for, uh, you know, you three and, and all the ones out there who will clinically and understand how to teach and structure. But you know, that's what the book is for, is for learning with you going down the path. You know, I'll give you a simple example. You know, the way the money comes in, if you have $3, one is supposed to go for what you have to pay. The number two is supposed to be an investment. And number three is what you would like to buy, but don't have to buy. Us as Americans, we put number three and number one. I, I've been, you know, <laughs> right? So, you know, I showed my daughter, I said, you know, baby, we're going to open up a little piggy bank in the year. Dad's going to match your money. So I matched her money and I have no idea how because she had $150. I mean, the tooth fairy these days is giving out $20. I have no, I don't know. <laughs> right. Inflation, man, is killer. Yeah, I'm, I, you know, I got two, uh, I got $2.25 for all my teeth. All of them. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I, you know, she had a hundred. So I, I, I said, here's a hundred that goes for helping mommy and daddy pay the bills. She was very happy with that. The second hundred, I said, why don't you invest? I, she, she said, I want to open a business. I said, what kind of business? I want to open a business. So basically, I said, when you open a business, you either solve a problem or bring somebody joy. And if you solve a problem, you bring them joy, right? So she she got all oh, Michael. She got a little empty bottle and put shells in them and started to give them and or sell them to her friends. But number three was the most important because that was the one that she could buy whatever she wants. So I said, as long as mommy and daddy are okay with it and the IRS and the police, we'll get to that another day. <laughs> <laughs> What do you want? She bought a beta fish. She bought a little fish. And what happened was she realized was she didn't have to wait for her birthday. She didn't have to guess what it was. She got it herself. Realized that that bought her freedom. And now she's hustling me in the hallway every time I walk by her for some more money. So. <laughs> Isn't that how it is, though? Because, like, I remember growing up and, like, my parents would always complain if, like, my brother and I broke something or, like, even by accident. And, like, as kids, we're like, well, they're just things. Like, it's a, a, right. like, just go buy another one. And then, like, as an adult having your own home and, like, you buy something and you're like, don't anyone touch it. <laughs> like, I spent my money on this. And so, yeah, kids really don't understand what it means to spend their own hard-earned money. So um, something that I, like, am really interested in, because I was just talking about this with my student teacher, um, is starting a class economy. So a lot of teachers do this already. I know um, plenty that already do. But actually using like proper terminology. And I saw um, one teacher on TikTok. Um, I think her name was Shelby. That's me. And she was doing a classroom economy with her third graders. And she actually taught them about inflation. So like, I guess her kids had jobs. And every week they would earn a paycheck for their job. And they could earn um, like bonuses if they got like good grades on tests or whatever. She said that um, she's like, all right, guys, today we're going to talk about inflation. So what inflation means is that things are just getting more expensive. 
And that means that your rent that was $5 is now going up to $7. And all the kids just collectively were like, no. (laughs) And then um, she's like, but I'm going to do something nice that the real world doesn't do. And I'm going to raise your income to accommodate for the inflation. So like she was teaching them that. And I'm like, how valuable that would have been to learn in the third right. grade mm-hmm. versus having to learn that as a 28 year old and struggling yeah. through your finances in adulthood. Hundred percent. And there's all those type of tips that we want to do. You know, one of the I have a teachers group as well because I get advised by them. And she, and this one lady, uh, one teacher was saying, you know what? We never leave time for O S. You know, we never have O S money, right? So she always has in her five days. She always has Curveball Wednesday. Mm. Right. Because, you know, traditionally we go, you know, we don't leave rooms for mistakes. Right. And and so things like that. So all of these little keys and, and tips are really, really crucial uh, to get kids prepared for for financial success. And listen, for the parents watching, if you want to be selfish about this, here's the data. Our kids going to take care of us two times longer than we take care of them. So if you don't want to have a dirty diaper house at some point, <laughs> make a change, you better you better make sure you take care you know, of this financial intelligence thing. Damon, think back to when you were in school. When did you first get taught about financial literacy? I didn't. I did not get taught about financial literacy at all. Um, but what I did was I, I'm dyslexic. And so I tried to shun away from school as much as possible. So I found a, a program called Co-op where I was able to work one week in the city and get a credit. And so I just found out about how to work. Yeah. Uh, but I almost went bankrupt uh, three times up until 30. And two of those times, I did not have any money. And one of those times, I had millions and millions of dollars. And I didn't understand why, uh, you know, how money worked until I started actually asking my accountants and everything, you know, questions that, you know, maybe I was too egotistical to ask, or I assumed that once I had money, they, these problems would go away, but they don't go away. I think what's important too is, uh, you know, financial illiteracy is a systemic issue, right? Like I grew up, I'm Puerto Rican, I grew up very poor, and my parents yeah. didn't know about anything about literacy. My mom grew right. up in Ibonito, Puerto Rico. I, I think I was saying in fifth grade, we did class ec- economy where we got money and we, uh, we got to open up our own business and people could give us money and we had jobs and then nothing else until... I was done with college, actually. I never had right. a class. I never was in high school that was taught this. So I realized, you know, after graduating and getting my own paycheck and, you know, health insurance that it was a systemic thing. I was falling into the same kind of cycles that my my parents did that. And mm-hmm. I couldn't figure out how to get out of that rut. And it's funny reading your book and then and just talking to him like, man, if I would have known this stuff, even in middle school or if you wanted to wait later in high school, I wouldn't have taken out so much student loans. Yeah. I, mean, I worked throughout all of high school and it still was just... You don't know what you don't know. Really don't. And you have to learn it sometimes the hard way or hopefully, you know, you'll find ways. You know, and what I want to do is I want to bring attention to all everybody who is creating these type of financial, you know, uh, you know, aspects of it because you just don't know. But, you know, first way that let's say all the parents right now watching, you know, a way to start having financial intelligence. You know what? On your feed, when you're watching, you got your Instagram and you have 20 things you're watching about fashion, about food, about yoga. Put 20 different sites on there that talk about finance. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. Don't buy anything. Oh, <laughs> and grab them. And you will notice that after scrolling about a year, you will be just a little more intelligent to start understanding because even like when we're talking about increasing people's salary for inflation, yeah, there's studies that show you can increase people's salaries, but if they don't have financial intelligence, they're going to increase their spending. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So often, you know, a lot of jo- a lot of CEOs that I know bring in training people to show people how to decrease their spending, meaning stop paying 18% for a credit card, get it down to this, taking cash back on a credit card, putting it into the market. Uh, so a lot of times it's just, it's money's a, simply a tool that does not lie. One of the things that we see a lot of right now in the teacher world is there's a lot of disagreements when it comes to what should teachers be teaching and what should parents be teaching? And financial literacy almost falls into that debate. So how do you think teachers and parents can bridge that gap better so then they can be on the same team when it comes to educating kids about financial literacy? And that's a challenge because I don't think there's any, it should be a debate. Now, if you want to talk to children about ethics and history in this country, embarrass, I think, you know, I can see the gray lines here. But it doesn't matter if you're balancing a checkbook at home uh, or you're balancing the checkbook of General Mills. Mm-hmm. The balancing of the checkbook needs to happen no matter what. 
And uh, I think that that is a that is a community job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. They're not and not just the parents. And well, first of all, I believe that every parent should be the one responsible for teaching their child. They brought the child in the world. We're hiring the amazing teachers at the end of the day, but it, it's my child. And yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but um, I, I believe that both parties side. Right. Um, yeah. Because you know what? Our parents, they may have financial literacy to some extent and African Americans normally come from legacy wealth. But if the children are understanding also, then you know what? They have a symbiotic relationship. Mom, dad, you know, there's something I fall, whatever, Bitcoin, whatever the case is. And, you know, and I'm about to you going to it. But <laughs> different ways that the, that the kids can teach the parents to and simultaneously we learn. So I think something else that's really important to bring up is also like coming back to this, the whole topic of student loans. College is not the only avenue for everybody. And I think that our generation, especially, I don't know about you guys, but I felt like it was very heavily pushed. And it was like, if you didn't go to college, you're a failure right. and you didn't do right by yourself in the world. So like something I try to do to help my students through that is I teach fifth grade. So I actually have them do a career research essay. And just as, as a fifth grader, as a 10 year old, what is your life goal right now? Like, what is it you want to work towards? And I never want to like, you know, shun a kid for choosing right, a right. dream. So some of them will be like, I want to be a pro wrestler or they'll be like, I want to be like uh, a SWAT team member or I want to be a horse trainer or like random things. And they have to literally research the, de the description of that job. They have to research what requirements you need to be able to have that career. They have to tell like what their daily tasks would be and where they would work, their environment, their salary, things like that. And um, a lot of them, after they do that research, some of them are like, you know, I kind of changed my mind. I really don't want this job after researching it. And they really enjoy that project. So what are some other things that maybe teachers could do to help kind of stoke that fire in kids to think about their futures and maybe what they really want to do? I don't really have an answer to that, but what you just said is brilliant because, you know, uh, as an investor, I see too many people that had uh, travel and, and I have nothing, I have nothing against higher education, you know, but the reality is today's kids that are graduating college, um, when they retire, they will, 50% of them will retire with a job title that doesn't actually exist today. That's like telling somebody 20 years ago, you were going to be a drone operator, a pay-per-click, Google pay-per-click or a social media expert. So, so if, you know, they're going to college and acquiring debt for a, a, a career that I didn't they want to have. But what I like about what this set is very powerful. I mean, many of our parents told us, go up, be a doctor or be this or be that. And we just, we just, that was hammered into us. Of, that is what that is. And as an investor, I see people that said, I did what my family wanted me to do. I got this career. I don't want to do this. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, so I really don't have, you taught me, obviously, and that's why I love speaking to uh, educators. You just taught me something absolutely brilliant that I think should happen. Thank so you. I don't have the answer for you, but you had an answer for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you know, Damon, I was uh, talking with my younger brother who he's 16 years old. He's a junior in high school. And we were talking about personal finance and, and what he's actually learning in high school. And he's like, you know, we're really not learning a whole lot. And I said, well, do, do people in high school have the desire to learn this stuff right now? And he said, Honestly, some kids, they don't have the desire to. And we kind of broke that down. Like, why Why are kids not fired up to learn about some of that stuff? And he said, well, I think it's a lot of times because young kids, when they're in high school, they think that's such a future them issue. You know, I think that that's so far down the road that they have to start caring about, mm -hmm. about their finances. If you could be in a classroom and you're talking to a group of high schoolers, what would you tell them about why they should care now about their financial health as they get older. First of all, I believe that they think it's a long way down the road. As we all know, when we were kids, we would think that, you know, somebody years old was, you know, I don't know what they were, right? Um, <laughs> and I, I think that because if they understand that, that can set them up. Because, you know, the reality is, you know, finance and investing is boring. It's not fun. It's just boring. But you know what? When when these kids come up in households where money is a stressful topic, well, they don't want to talk about that anyway, right? Yeah. But a kid in high school who is 16 years old, if that kid starts saving and not in private high school, but at 25 years old, if you save $100 a month, you put it in well, automatic debit into the market and something $100 a month, 
By 65 years old, that's $1.2 million. And to understand it, you have to understand that early. People are normally not understand that till they're 40. They need the money at, at 50 already, right? So I think that understanding is make smart decisions. They have to, so I have to tell them that they can get quality of life if they understand earlier. And by 30, they could probably be better off than most people for the rest of their lives because they're learning it now. And unfortunately, yeah, yeah. 30 when people start to learn it. Mm-hmm. It's such a scary thought yeah. because I, I remember like when I was in high school, I had that same thought. It was like, well, whatever I need to know about adulting, I could just ask my mom and then she'll teach me. And cause you know, she's an adult, right. so she mm-hmm. knows all that. And then now I'm like, oh crap, I'm the adult and I don't, I still don't know what I'm <laughs> yeah. doing half I don't the know, time. Up from down. I think right. everyone's just trying to do their best <laughs> and uh-huh. like, uh, maybe I'm supposed to get life insurance now. I don't know. Maybe I'm supposed to start investing. Mm. I don't know. So you just do it your best that you can, but maybe there should be an adulting 101 class no, in high sure. school. Yeah. Like all the basic things, like how to pay a mortgage or how do you file your taxes or how do you know but you have to start earlier that's that's the point right because i mean let's let's look at shark tank and you know here's one reason i'm taking the journey on i've been in as you said i you know you were watching me in school we don't have any heroes anymore you know the kids after they get out about five years old prior to that they have Peppa Pig, daniel tied to the top of the train from five to around 12 they have basically splintered youtube families playing with toys yeah. Right. And they're not learning. They're more excited about unboxing than to creating what's in the box. Correct. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's where we're at right now. But if you start those little key lessons right around five and six, it becomes normal. Because just like Shark Tank, before Shark Tank was on, you know, did anybody know what a royalty was? Did anybody know what life thing was? Did anybody know what barges were? You know, uh, you know, so, you know, you wanted to become the norm of a conversation with a child. And what we look at is, yeah, we kids, we opened up our lemonade stand. It was about the amount of people that drove by. That was the biggest market we have now. A kid's lemonade stand could be their phone and it could be their entire world. Right. Yeah. yeah. And these are times that our children need to have financial intelligence to understand how to, how to use their, in their advantage. I like that you're talking about doing it early because as we we're talking, like when they get into high school or even middle school, some of it's I don't want to learn. But I think some of it, too, when you don't have money, it's that it's an anxiety thing of learning, right? When you mm-hmm. hear your parents talking about financial difficulties, it's not so much you don't want to learn. It's that it is a topic that's brought a lot of tension. Yeah. So what I liked for the Head Start program is, is a lot of the stuff is um, like we have a dramatic play area and it's not just like go in and it's a house. It's, you know, for a month, it's a barber shop. For the next month, it's a restaurant. For the And so having the the, the money there, you, you might not be talking about like invest this, but we, you can talk about there's a tr- there's a trade. Oh, if you don't have any money in the purse or wallet you have, I can't give you this at the barber shop. So there's a little bit of understanding. You're introducing the concept of you can't just take things, right? There's yeah. there's an exchange of money that has to happen. And if I think you start that even at pre-K and you build on that each year, that conversation of finances won't bring as much anxiety because you've had it in more places than just at home mm-hmm. where there's, if, if there's a lack of. So yeah. like if you teach, okay, has anyone seen that TikTok with the dog and the guy is teaching his dog about financial literacy? <laughs> no. So there's this, it's like an Alaskan Malamute and he's, he has a plate of pineapple sitting on his coffee table and he'll be like, pineapple, fresh pineapple for sale. And the dog will come over for the pineapple and he'll say that I need money, sir. And he got them like little money stuffed toys. So they have little cash toys and then they have a little black credit card toy. And so he's teaching his dog that like, okay, when you pay with cash, you don't get the cash back. And he's like, that's it. You don't have no more cash. Go away. And the dog leaves. And then he grabs the credit card toy and brings it over. And he goes, cha-ching. All right, here's your pineapple. And he gets the card back. And so he like taught his dog how to how to pay with money or credit. So it's like, if you could teach a dog, you, you could teach, teach a preschooler. Teach a yeah, I mean, listen, <laughs> I got to Google that and I got to post it. That is great. <laughs> oh, I love it's hysterical. It. <laughs> you know, Damon, you're such a successful entrepreneur. And I'm curious, when did you first have that taste of entrepreneurship and you realize, ah, crap, this might be for me. This this might be the thing that, I, that I'm good at. Six years old, I, I was, um, you, you probably wouldn't like this as teachers, but I realized that, you know, um, the boys, when they liked the girls, they would like beat them up, you know, or, or stuff like that. So I realized that if I go get these pencils and I would scrape the paint off the pencils and put the names of the prettiest girls in school on the pencils. And I would try to, I think maybe I was eight years old and I would try to sell it to the guy and say, 
you don't want to beat them up. You want to get to know them. And so I <laughs> for 25 cents a piece and say, well, you can then go and give it to her and talk to her. And then they would, uh, they would beat me up. Um, <laughs> but then I realized that if I sold it to the girls, they would buy, they would pay two times the amount of money for the same exact pencils with their names on it. So I sold it to the girls and my principal made me shut that business down after only two weeks because she found out I was stealing the pencils from the guys that I had. Oh my, <laughs> <laughs> my cost of goods was zero. Yeah. They, call that, they call that hustling. That's what they call that. No, that actually happened at my brother's school because my brother's also a teacher and one of the girls at his school started a business where she was like making bracelets or something and she would just bring them in and sell them to kids at lunch or whatever. And the kids, like, whenever someone comes in with, with something to sell, the kids are all over it. Yeah. And they, they literally shut it down, and then they suspended her for selling oh, her bracelets at school. And I, like, from a legality standpoint, I don't know, like, where their mindset was. Maybe it was a thing they couldn't do. But, like, yeah. from a teacher standpoint, I'm like, you just shut down that entrepreneur. <laughs> like, she had a business. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, she's going to come back and buy that school in another 20 years. Exactly. Right. <laughs> right. So, you know, you were six years old, and you, you get your own pencil gig going on, and that's how you learned you loved entrepreneurship. How do you give young kids right now that taste of entrepreneurship? Is it still, hey, go set up your lemonade stand. Is it still doing that? Or are there kind of new tips and tricks that we can do to help encourage entrepreneurship with young kids? Well, yeah. How do you, how do you create a form? You know, well, uh, listen, I want to try to tell kids anything that you buy, you can sell. And so how do they create things that they, they can, they can actually sell? I mean, yeah, it is the lemonade stand, but it's not it could be obviously up yeah, yeah, parents or rights and stuff like that. But you know, the same way we used to bring kids to the office, they run around to all the cubicles and try to sell things. It's the same way they try to put it on sites. But yeah, you have to craft it. You have to give them the process of building though. And we even have work people now about how to build. I mean, the whole concept of the little Damon Learns Art is, you know, he wants he wants to buy his favorite poster, but he only has a couple of dollars, you know, from a from a rock star he loves. Uh, but then he gets his little gang to all dump in, but they don't work just to date. He's like, you can dance, you can sing, you can paint. We're going to buy one shirt, we're going to sell it, and then we're going to take that jerk, the money, and buy five shirts, and sell them. And now we all have made money. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that creativeness about entrepreneurship and financial intelligence, it's a team sport. So again, you know, I'll leave it up to the teachers, all of you, to see how do you, how do you get kids to realize anything that they are buying or consuming they can sell you know that's it's so difficult as a teacher because like for me i'm a seventh grade science teacher there's such little time in my day to have that conversation with the kids i think about really the only time that i have to do that is during what's called a pro time it's it's like our homeroom and I, i i don't have the time structured in the day to introduce those ideas to the students how how much time is it 25 minutes 25 minutes Oh, that, that's a half episode of Shark Tank. Yeah, right? but, but <laughs> and, 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 there you go. And, 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 there you go. Bring back the Shark yeah. Tank episode. I think I think a lot of a lot of uh, teachers struggle finding the time because everything's so structured in education, where you you've got certain things you have to teach at certain times, and that's challenging. So, what do you wish that your daughters would be getting taught right now in school? I would think that administrators should be issuing that. This should be a unified. Um, effort. This should not be a, you know, you should slide this in here. You should slide this in there. I just don't think that's what it should be. You know, um, I, you know, the same way that my daughter, you know, goes to shop, you know, um, you know, I don't know if she's ever going to build a birdhouse, but during that time, you know, when shop existed, that's when we're in the industrial age and we were in world war, you know, we needed that. We're in the information age now. It's a totally different time. I think that there should be an actual class yeah. for finance and STEM and programming tech and stuff like that. Uh, it needs to be carved out. I think about it a lot being, and I'm I'm also dyslexic and my dyslexia, a lot of it comes from the numbers. Um, and so yeah. I remember struggling throughout all of, specifically high school of the numbers. But I remember at one point being like, why isn't there, instead of me having to take, you know, algebra two or, you know, pre-calc, why isn't there a class, you know, finances or math, you know, instead of taking pre-calc senior year, why can't I take a class that's... Right. How many times did you spend, like, finding the slope of an angle? I, you know, I have, I have, I have, <laughs> In I your not. adult life. Now, if I wanted to be an engineer or a mathematician, that those are right. important things, but, you know, not wanting to go go into that, it would have been better to say, I know, I know I'm not going to use the higher end of, the, of math. What I will use is how to figure out tax percentage when I'm buying stuff and, you know how to buy a house and 
balancing a checkbook. Yeah. Compounding interest yeah. and very yes. You know, we just we just went up a couple of points on um, you know, in the you know, in inflation and that's people don't realize because a lot of people think, oh, two, three points. That's devastating yeah. to a lot of people. But they, they only go, Oh, it's two, three points. No, no. That is devastating to a lot of people. But unless you learn that earlier that it is all about the couple of points that what it is. And you're right. You know, it's math at the same time. It's, it's just a point where you're getting both pieces of knowledge at the same time. Yeah, and it affects everyone. It's not like no matter what career you have, it affects you in your adult life. Like we were just, like we built a house a couple years ago and I look back at what we paid for our house then and like the interest rate then and we were looking at refinancing and like putting a chunk down so we could lower the payment again and the the rate like doubled and we were like never mind, we'll stick with this. Like <laughs> Yeah. But like it's it's a scary thought, like not having any of that knowledge and just kind of having to like you know feel your way through the dark and figure it out on your own. Yeah, it, it's hard. And I think about like my school experience, uh, you know, living in South Dakota. The only state requirement for financial literacy was one semester of personal finance when you were in high school. There wasn't even Nothing. a requirement. Like Nothing. mine was a, an elective that was like personal finance. It, and like it was like a blow off class. Like the seniors took it because whoever the teacher was that taught it was like she was a little older, close to retirement. It was kind of like just a blow off elective. So I don't know what they did in that class, but it was not required. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it, it's so challenging to find that time, like I said earlier, to truly teach these kids about financial literacy. And it's just, it's so important to just try to push and try to make it work. We're seeing some of the some of the school schools and organizations are starting to make this a, a priority. I think it was uh, Chicago and North Carolina, something like that. And, and, I, and I hope uh, it just has to move faster. It has yeah. to move faster. You know, at a younger age, you know, it really does. Let's, let's say you, you have a conversation right now with a superintendent of a school. What would you tell them about financial literacy and why it's important to implement it in all three levels, the elementary school, the middle school and the high school? I actually did have a comment. You know, I actually spoke with the superintendents of America uh, about last year and I told them the same thing. I said, we are becoming a country of debt. And when you look at bad health and things of that nature, it is not really a food thing. It is a finance thing. It is when we don't have enough finance, what happens? That is stress. That adds for bad character, bad, a lot of things. And it's challenging. Stress is the number, uh, financial stress is the number one reason of divorces and various other things. I said, it is, it is, it is what we work off of this system of money, no matter what. And kids understand points. They understand when their children at a young age, oh, I get this amount of points for a folky man or this and that. So I told them that it's up to you as the educators to teach them this because what do you do? You reduce incarceration, you increase taxpayers, more more people who are wealthier and donating towards the uh, our our overall system. It's critical because this is something that no matter what they're gonna have to face. Right? I don't know if you're gonna need history. I don't know if you're gonna need another language. But I know you're gonna need finance, no matter what, and it's critical. And it has to start today. Like a lot of teachers, obviously, we, we don't make a lot of money as educators, especially starting out. So a lot of teachers have like side gigs or they have like, you know, Etsy and things like that where they're trying to be entrepreneurs. Are there any like tips that you would provide to anyone trying to, you know, earn a little bit of additional income on the side for themselves? Yeah, I mean, first of all, you have to understand business setup a structure, you know, because, uh, you know, when I was talking to my teachers, my teachers group, they said, we don't understand a lot of this finance stuff. They didn't know what the difference was of good debt and bad debt, right? Mm -hmm. You know, good, good debt is when somebody else pays your bills and bad debt is when you pay your bills. Meaning, good <laughs> debt, you know, good debt is you go and buy a house at, a, what, let's use a simple number, $100,000, right? And it's $500 a month for the rent and you charge somebody. Seven hundred and fifty dollars a month for rent, and they pay your bills. Right, mm -hmm. and that's what good debt is. That's what the country, you know, all the big people that build building, and you know, our teachers need to understand that if they are doing Etsy, well, here's how this works, right? When you are employed by somebody and you make a hundred dollars, well, the government takes their forty percent. If you have Etsy, you have a new business. Well, when you spend, when you make a hundred dollars, well, you're supposed to take out. Your office expense, your salary, da 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 da, da. and then when you come down, maybe you have fifty dollars left. Then the government takes their little fee, right? 
It's about opening a business. These are all financial structures that people need to understand. I think that's so cool. And I know so many teachers, they want to go into the entrepreneurial side of things. And I look at my dad as an example where mm -hmm. he is a teacher. And then in the summer, he has his own landscaping business. And he's fallen in love with being an entrepreneur. And for me as a kid, I loved seeing my dad do that. I love seeing him have a business. And it showed me, oh my gosh, when you have skin in the game, it makes you work so hard. Yeah. Like it makes you work. I mean, I, I remember being up with my dad early in the morning, working till, you know, at night we were cutting retaining wall block and working and and having that little taste of entrepreneurship, man, that, that got me fired up. It got me fired up and I realized, okay, I want to go in education, but I do want my own thing as well. I, I yeah. want that. We kind of are in that boat a little bit right now, whereas like we are teachers, but we're also kind of building our own brands mm -hmm. as like being on social media. And with that comes the financial aspect of that also. Anytime you work with another brand and you get paid, like I had to learn taxes all over again <laughs> right. because I didn't know, you know, how that worked and expenses and things like that. And it's just like mind boggling how much I didn't know mm -hmm. before doing this. Yeah. Yeah. You don't know what you don't know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Damon, with your book, did you ever think that you would be writing a children's book? Just like on Shark Tank, we, we, we go into companies that we really love because we all of a sudden relate to it. And my oldest girl, the 29, 24, this wouldn't have been something I was paying attention to. But all of a sudden now, uh, you know, when I have this little baby at, at, like I said, at five and six, I know she didn't have any heroes. She didn't have Mr. Rogers or, or anybody else. And I said, oh my God, you know, who's going to teach her something? And unlike when we were, you know, we were kids and our parents would cut the TV off. These kids, you know, if they have an iPad in the back of the car, they just put this thing right on top and go to sleep and they keep hearing this thing going on and on and on. And she was starting to watch kids like shows that were between talking about different issues like Hannah Montana and all that. Yeah. Every time my wife and I got into an argument, she was like, well, you're going to get divorced. We're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, or she said, Bobby, when are you going to die? And I was like, where did you get that from? Because she was watching a show where. I don't know, dad, the mother had passed away and the dad found a new wife. I was like, this is way too heavy for a little six year old. Uh, that's why this started to become my, my, my lifelong journey because I realized they don't have one place to go. And with me being in Liverpool for the last 14 years, you know, they relate to me. So what you're saying is you're going to create a TV show now that talks about financial literacy and it's going to be on Disney Channel, right? That, that you're just teasing that? create as many things I can and if somebody else has it, I'm gonna I'm going to uh highlight whatever they have. This is not about me. This is about yeah. Yeah, yeah. our children. Honestly though, is is uh little Damon gonna be a reoccurring character? Yeah, little Damon will be a little uh, a reoccurring character. Absolutely. Hundred percent. So yeah. I, you know, I, I think about that book and you know, with it being targeted toward elementary, it's so awesome. But I'm jealous as a middle school teacher. I now want a book about Lil Damon when he's a middle schooler. I, <laughs> I want to see yeah. that. I want to see him grow and see him all of a sudden now when he gets to high school, the lessons middle, that middle he Damon, can, Middle, middle Damon. Damon. Middle <laughs> Damon. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, as, as a teacher, there's no shortcuts. Can't Damon, Little Damon can't all of a sudden go that fast. I'm sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> he has to pay his dues. So w with your book, what do you want the largest takeaway to be? The largest takeaway is for families to gather around and have a good time and have this open their mind to this concept. You know, I've worked with a lot of organizations like Network for Teaching Entrepreneurship. And, you know, when I realized and what they did, they have a great, uh, I think a documentary called 1098. I grew up around, I grew up in a community, obviously, drug, you know, riddled with drugs and stuff like that. But when you show the kid that they can take a box of pencils and, and, and sell them for 10 cents a piece and the box is $1, but now they have $2.50. They realize that they don't have to go and sell drugs. They don't have to do that. So whether it is a financial, uh, whether it is kids in, you know, okay to do family, middle class family, or other places, I want them to understand that entrepreneurial entrepreneurship is now something that they can do, and they can utilize these skills as a person that works in a corporation as well. Entrepreneurial thinking can be utilized anywhere, and I just want to bring families together. And unfortunately. The people that need it the most can't afford it. So what I've been doing with my corporate partners is trying to find as many people who want to donate to a 501c3, get it out to the hands of the children, and the teachers. I'm giving my digital curriculum. By the way, God, give me your uh, emails. I got a three thousand dollar digital curriculum that I'll give you when entrepreneurship. And I just want to spread it to many people like that to hopefully change this, uh, change the storyline or the narrative of this country of us. Of, of us going into debt. We so appreciate what you do. I mean, I, I think it's yeah. incredible that, 
you know, a guy like you who you've got every opportunity out there and all of a sudden you're like, you know what, I'm writing a children's book because I want to give back. I want to help people. And that's that's one of the reasons why we were so excited to talk to you because it's it's that mission that you have that we love. We love that. And, and you want to yeah. start that process of of teaching kids about, you know, starting at a young age. If you care about money when you're young, it's going to help you out so much when you're older. Because like I see in my brother who's 16, I'm seeing a generation of kids who they weren't taught about financial literacy at all. And then all of a sudden now you're getting strapped with just massive student loan debt. You get told, hey, go to college. And then now you're signing papers or you're $60,000 in debt. And it's debt. not even, yeah, but it's like, you know, you get kind of like, like charmed into going to these massive universities mm -hmm. also. Like, like I'm from Ohio. So like everyone and their brother went to OSU and, you know, you walk out with $100,000 in debt and you're going to school for a, a career that's only going to make you you know, starting maybe $45,000. So now you're saddled with $100,000 in the negative and you're mm -hmm. like, what do I do from here? Yeah, so. I, think, I think that's why I loved the book is because you're calling in this conversation. Like you said, that families gather around. So not only is it, it's it's a family moment and there's learning I was doing when I was reading the book <laughs> quite, at 31 years yeah. old, you know, teaching for 10 years. I mean, you're just now talking about like good debt and bad debt. I was like, t tell it's me like, more. <laughs> like, <laughs> on, and I can go back a second. Um, but it, I like that it was calling in, you know, it's a gentle but super educational way of having that conversation. And I, what I liked about the book is it's, it's a fun book. So kids are going to want to read it again and again. I think most schools do funders. That's a, another perfect time to have yeah. a conversation We're about. We're teaching them to be little salespeople. Tell them about the money aspect yeah. of that. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> so, so Damon, when and where can people get their hands on Little Damon Learns to Earn? March 21st, but well, you can pre-order it now. And um, I wasn't even prepared for that. I think you can pre-order it on Amazon or Barnes and Noble or all the the regular places. Um, I, I just, I'm sorry, everybody. I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it, but uh, <laughs> no, yeah. I'm a hundred percent grabbing a copy because yeah. I, I was reading it last night, literally in line at the airport. I'm reading through it. I'm like, Oh my God, this is so cute. <laughs> like I want to yeah. read this to my kids now. <laughs> and of course you can follow me at the shark Damon, where I do a, a great thing of, you know, you buy one, you give one to a school uh, and to those I in love need. That. And, I love that. And, and like I said, I have other programs where you can uh, you know, I can do like virtual keynotes for communities and you donate all the way to your 501c3 C of choice and they give out the, the books to the schools and, you know, I'm I'm donating almost everything. I am donating everything, not almost. You're such a rock star. That's and so cool. We, like as educators, like it's, it's not often we come across somebody who's like heavily in our corner and yeah. in the corner of educating children. And it has become so politicized that we forget that the main goal is to help set up kids mm -hmm. for success. Yeah. That's and right. I, I, I know we all agree that we just appreciate so much that you're you're here with us today. We appreciate your time and everything that you're doing for kids across the country and across the world. Well, thank you. I always say the two underappreciated commodity in this country are teachers and veterans. So thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. Uh, my, 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 my favorite uncle was a guidance counselor. And um, you know, he taught me so much and he believed in me as a little dyslexic boy and he helped me so much. So thank you for what you do. And I appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. And thank you for everybody for tuning in this week. Uh, make sure you check out his book, Little Damon Learns to Earn. It's fantastic. Oh, yeah, I think I have a little copy. I, I oh, will yeah, see, it. see it. I see it. There oh, it yay. is. Yeah, this, this is the worksheet. This is the worksheet where Ooh. it shows your, your P&L statement and all that kind of this stuff. So there you go. You're a father of three, an entrepreneur, but not only that, but you're a very vocal advocate, you know, for a lot of social justice and equity issues that we're facing right now. If there's one message you could put out to students and educators out there, um, what what do you think that would be? First of all, as we talk about financial intelligence, where you see a lot of the stripe comes from, uh, when I created my company, Fubu, in 1992, a lot of the same things were going on, Rodney King, and I realized that people were uh, burning businesses and they should be building them. And economic empowerment is exactly what we should do. As well as, you know, 90% of us, we have more common than we have apart. It's really only 10% of the country trying to rip us apart. That's all it really is. You know, every one of us, we just want to work hard. They work, love who we want to love for whatever reason, to worship who we want to worship. That's it. You know, um, and never be and, and never be accused of something we didn't do. And that's it. I mean, you know, so don't don't allow these people because, you know, when you when you put out these negative things that will have people talking about it 20 times a day. 
when you put out positive things like you amazing teachers trying to find ways in science in a science class to find ways to fit in financial intelligence all this, this, nobody's talking about that you know we're, we're talking about the bad things right and it's you know i'm just a, i'm just a very positive person if you look at shark tank it's you no know, that entrepreneurial carpet it doesn't care about your color your gender your race your creed your sexual perfect all that carpet cares about are you ready to wake up before everybody fail the hunt on go to sleep after everybody and do it all over again and i think that's the american dream and uh you know we should we should honor this great country we're in by 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 coming together that's how i think I love it. I think it's that was the best message. I yeah. think that was the best send off this it show was. has had in the, in the year and a half <laughs> <Yes>. it's existed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hey, we appreciate you taking your time. I mean, seriously, this is an incredible opportunity, and we're very honored to have you with us today. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so thank much you for, for your support. time, thank and thank you, you for, for everyone to, for joining us. And we will see you guys in the next episode. <laughs>